Hi everyone, welcome to episode 44 of Smug Mug Live. I'm your host, Alistair Jolly. As always, this show is brought to you by Smug Mug and Flickr. If you're looking for somewhere to showcase your work, sell your work to clients, store your images in the cloud, then check out everything we have to offer at smugmug.com. If you're looking to connect with photographers around the world, be inspired and motivated, then check out everything we have to offer at flickr.com. Thank you for joining us wherever you are in the world today. I really appreciate your time. As always... I love the fact that you support this channel, so please, if you can, hit that subscribe button, hit that little bell notification, that way you'll be notified of all the episodes that we've got coming up here on the show. Uh, this is the last show of the week, I'll be joined very, very shortly by a good friend, Lou Noble, uh, but as always, it's always great to hear who's joining us today, so at any point today while you're watching the show, get in that chat window, give yourself a shout out, let us know what part of the world you're joining from. And as always, if you have any questions at any point today, post them in the chat window and I will ask Lou those questions. And he says the harder the question, the better for him. So uh, you can't hear him, he's laughing in my ear right now. So um, yeah, ask those questions. Do me a little favour, you know, post the word question before you ask the question. Uh, that way it's a bit easier to find it in the chat window. Uh, but for now, thank you so much for joining. Uh, Next week, we have some great episodes coming up next week, uh, so do tune into the schedule here on the channel. We've been, we'll be posting uh, that coming up uh, on Tuesday. The next show, I'll be joined by Curtis Jones, who's a great expedition uh, explorer, uh, outdoor photographer based up in Newfoundland in Canada. So he'll be joining us uh, next Tuesday. And then, uh, yeah, we've got a few more episodes uh, to be D uh, for next week, but stay tuned and we'll let you know what those are. Uh, but for now, let's see if Lou is with us. Hi, Lou, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Well, I always say, like, let's see if Lou's with us or let's see if the guest is with us, even though I know you're there because I have you online. But uh, yeah, it's what we do on YouTube. It's how you introduce a guest. So how are you, sir? It's tradition. I'm good. How are you doing? It's a tradition that I started, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so where do we find you today? I am in Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Sunny Los Angeles. Is it a nice day in Los Angeles today? It is. Yeah. It I, is. Uh, I watched the sunrise today and uh, cool. did about two hours of surfing and then rushed back in. Oh, man. Living the dream. You're an early riser, right? Yeah. I, uh, I was up at 5.30 today. And I was in the water by 7 a.m. Getting up at 5, that's still like yesterday. That's, that's not getting <laughs> up early. That's not staying up late or getting up late, something like that. <laughs> it's, you know, I've been getting up early since I was 21 years old. So yeah, a couple it's, of uh, years. It's old hat for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so a few hours surfing in, that's pretty cool. Um, mm -hmm. So hopefully the, the people join us today for the show uh, maybe a little bit familiar with you. Uh, some people might not know who you are. We obviously know you through uh, the great relationship we have with you uh, over at Flickr.com. Uh, but mm -hmm. can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself uh, and your photography? Uh, and then we'll get a little bit deeper into that. Sure. Uh, I was born, raised, and live in Los Angeles. I work as a medic on film sets. Uh I've been a hobbyist photographer since about 2005, seriously, as a passion. Uh, I run a photo site called the Photographic Journal that was started by another photographer, Augustine Sanchez. Uh, that's, that's probably like the, the capsule bio. <laughs> uh, and you say you're a hobbyist photographer, but what type of photography? I mean, obviously the show is called Going Deeper with Portrait Photography, so that maybe gives it away, but you're a portrait artist, right? Yeah, I, I exclusively work in portraiture uh, and we pretty can, much since I picked up a camera. We can tell just by the wall behind you that's all portraits. And anybody familiar with your work, uh, you know, will definitely know your 
portrait work and, and how incredible it is. And we're huge fans of your work. Thank you. And it's one of the reasons I wanted to get you on your show. But you're, um, you've, already, you've already said it, you're a hobbyist. And that's one thing I wanted to cover today is you're quite, um, quite upfront about the fact that this is not a job. Right. Yeah. Very. I'm. I'm. Vo I'm a vocal proponent of art remaining separate from profession, from uh, a job, uh, which isn't to say you know don't make money from it every once in a while. But I have very much enjoyed not being a professional, not having those stresses, those uh, particular challenges, those compromises, and that's something that probably because it's so popular to think of something you're good at and then wonder if you can make it into a job because of how entrenched that is, especially in American culture, I, uh, I kind of work in opposition to that. Mm, that's interesting because I've kind of gone full circle in, in my career of having been a full-time uh, I won't use the word professional because I think you can, I personally think you can be professional and not make money about it, but uh, sure. full-time photographer uh, as a living um, and now obviously, you know, for the last, nearly the last decade, I've worked at Smug Mug and Flickr. Um, I personally enjoy my photography more now than, uh, way more now than I did near the, near the end of my professional career, my, my life, you know, living career. Uh, it definitely became, I wouldn't say a chore, but, you know, the joy of it was was gone. Um, I wasn't taking pictures of things I should, like my kids and my family, because, you know, it was the last thing <laughs> right. I wanted to do was pick up a camera, at the, you know, after photographing all week. So I really... Creatively burned out. Yeah, yeah, creatively yeah. really burnt out. Um, and now in this role, I get to spend time with, you know, the best photographers in the world. And I'm super inspired and excited to go take, you know, take pictures. Uh, and I just love that approach that you have, that you're, you know, open and saying, look... I love my art so much. I don't want to taint it by, or or ruin that. Right? It's it's a matter of freedom for me. I have the freedom to shoot when I want, what I want, as often as I want. Uh, I don't have to worry that if I'm not shooting, I don't eat. I don't have to worry that if I'm not shooting something that's popular, I don't eat. I don't pay my rent. My Art is not weighed down with responsibility, with obligation. Mm. It's in a completely different space for me. So it always stays something that I can enjoy or that, you know, especially during this particular time, I haven't been taking that many pictures, mm. but it doesn't weigh me down because it's not tied to, well, I have to take pictures because yeah. or I don't eat. Yeah. It's uh, definitely a, a lot of freedom, and you know, right, right now where we are with the pandemic, there's you know, a whole whole section of our community that is in that position, and you know, I you know, my heart bleeds for them. That there's not a lot of business out there at the moment, so having that freedom to be an artist is is uh, yeah, definitely a powerful thing at the moment. Yeah. So, how did you be become an artist, and how did you? choose photography as that medium to and put and why portraiture sure at first it was just something i uh, was curious about picked up a camera probably at 18 19 a polaroid camera and was just taking pictures of friends taking pictures of family and that is how it stayed until around 2005 i joined Flickr, not even really for the photography, but because I was writing for a blog and we were looking for ways to promote. Mm -hmm. So I was just posting the photos I had taken recreationally and I started meeting other people who were into Polaroid. And one person, this guy, Todd Brilliant, said, you know, all your, a lot of your pictures are out of focus. I can see what you're trying to do, uh, but you're using the wrong camera. So he suggested a different camera. And once I, once I started picking that up, uh, it was transformative. Uh, I could see almost instantly what I wanted to do. I wanted to get closer to people. I wanted to really 
do something I wasn't able to do at the time just on a personal level was to interact with people comfortably, was to find out about them, communicate with them. Back then I was a lot more shy, uh, a lot more nervous when it came to talking to strangers. Photography allowed me to meet more people, make more friends. And then the more I did that, the more I wanted to take pictures. So uh, from 2005 until you know today, that is how I see for my photography and art is a way is a kind of a bridge between me and another person that's that's pretty cool and it became self-perpetuating the more you did it the more connections you made the more photographs you wanted to do um yeah did you say todd brilliant yeah yeah real name. That real name <laughs> that's that's <laughs> awesome everything in scotland Everything in Scotland, we call oh, that's brilliant. It's a very Scottish yeah. thing oh, to yeah. say. So yeah. he'd he'd go down I well mean, over here. Back in the early days of Flickr, everybody had a handle, mm -hmm. and so we assumed, assumed. that that was <laughs> that was just a handle, but it, it turned out to be his real yeah. name. He's everybody, brilliant. you know, the the real names, the the names that were so cool, uh, they had to be fake. Were real, and the ones <laughs> that were yeah so mundane as to be real were fake. <laughs> He's brilliant, <laughs> I'm jolly, and you're noble. I mean, right. it's, yeah. it's the trifecta right there. It's awesome. But, um, you know, I had a, I had a handle. You know, like I used uh, Luo Bedlam, which I still use everywhere, just as something I found in a comic book probably in the mid-90s. I, uh, the... I was going to ask you about I was going to ask you about the Bedlam, or Bedlam thing. Yeah, they, I, I believe they had something called a Tomo Bedlam back in England, in the you know 1800s i think they yeah. it's what they called the uh the inmates of bethlehem hospital when it closed okay. all the you know people who ended up on the street because they called that place bedlam because of all the uh, mentally ill people they had mm -hmm. there they were tomo bedlams and so i just moved a little name around and <laughs> there it was <laughs> I wasn't sure whether I, we, we could read more into it or... I wish. <laughs> I ended up stuck with it for, I don't know, 20 years. On, you know, yeah. The name you choose when you first get online. Be very careful Absolutely. with it. Hey, listen, I know someone that could change it, but, you know... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's everywhere, you know. It, it Twitter, is. Yeah. Instagram, it's my website. It's, yeah. it's too late. It's right below you, right, right there. I know. Um, I know. The... <laughs> So, Mr. Brilliant suggested a camera to you. Was that a Polaroid? Was that a different Polaroid camera at that point? It was. Um, and this is actually, uh, hopefully, my piece for the Flickr blog next month was that I he suggested a camera called the Polaroid 680, mm -hmm. which is just a, probably the finest camera Polaroid ever made. Yep. Uh, but the you know the main reason he suggested it is that unlike most Polaroids, where you have a good three feet is your minimum focusing distance. For the 680, you can get, I believe it's 10 inches away. So you can get very close. Uh, you know, you can see it on the wall behind me. You can get a lot closer than you would with another Polaroid camera. Mm -hmm. And that closeness was really something that I was unconsciously drawn to. And it took me a while to figure that out. But I've always been somebody who looks at my pictures a lot. And eventually the, the pattern became clear. Mm. It's interesting because you said when you first started, you were, you know, you were quite shy uh, at approaching people, and now you're talking about a camera where you can literally get in people's faces. Um, and I know, you know, knowing your work, it is very close. So, how, you know, when were you suddenly able to sort of break those you know, invisible barriers of personal space and that type of stuff? Was that, or, or did that camera help you do that? It was the camera. As soon right. as I got the camera, as soon as it physically allowed me to get closer, I started wanting to fill the frame with people's faces. And that enabled me to get both physically and conversationally closer. Uh, at the same time that I was really getting into this, I had been working uh, as a, an EMT on an ambulance. Mm -hmm. And that experience as well, you know, when you are asking a wife, you know, when her husband started having a heart attack, conversation is very easy yep. because it's so immediate. It's so important. Everything else becomes less uh, nerve wracking, hmm. you know, so it became easier for me to talk to people because once you start 
going out there and talking to people in medical emergencies, you can talk to people in any situation. So I think both of those things at the same time uh, really eliminated a lot of my general shyness. Hmm. So you, you obviously, yeah, I mean, that's quite a ceiling to break through talking to someone in some of the, the scariest moments of their life. So I guess that, you know, talk, suddenly talking to a model or talking to, to a stranger about a picture maybe got put in perspective a little bit for you. Exactly. Yeah. And then I real, just generally realized that there's really the pressure you put on yourself in conversation mm -hmm. is exactly that. It's just pressure you put on yourself. You know, it's not a contest. There's nothing really to be lost. There are, the stakes are very low. Yeah, so, it's true. you know, it's once you realize you've got nothing to lose, really, it, it makes it easier. Yeah. I know um, so many photographers who have come into photography um, as, as, as a profession. They've moved full time into photography as a profession kind of via via their previous career there's something about their previous career that inspired them or triggered a love of photography and stuff but i'm trying to see if there's a connection between being a medic and an, or an emt and photography was that was there ever not no, no. it's completely separate <laughs> yeah you, you can't, one you, you definitely can't take pictures mm. um i it, it definitely helped having the experience as an EMT, it made conversation easier. Uh, it, it makes it easier for me in general to talk to people. Knowing medicine, uh, you can always ask, you know, about ailments they're having mm -hmm. or if they talk about, people always talk about themselves and having some insight into maybe what's wrong with them or how to deal with, the, you know, some injury, it, it helps. But in terms of a but there was no photography in your role or anything like that as an EMT. You know, a few of our, a few of our friends and ambassadors, uh, um, like Brett Florence, who's an amazing uh, wedding photographer. He was a South African police officer, um, and he then got. Um, I'll, I'll use the word enlisted to become the scene of crimes officer. We had to document uh, some some fairly unpleasant stuff. Um, so you know, there's there's some some paths. Yeah, I know I know yeah. I know quite a few scene of crimes officers. Um, it was something I'd considered dabbling with. Uh, oh, okay. Many many years ago, I actually wanted to be a forensic scientist, and then realized you don't actually make much money as a friend <laughs> <laughs> sounds cool but it's, it's not that great so there's no connection between your role but this uh there's obviously a connection with you and people it's it's quite clear yeah. looking at your work that um you know i take portraits uh, i spent a lot of time professionally taking portraits but we're talking about on this show going deeper because I definitely see a deeper connection between the portraiture that you do and any portraiture I've ever taken. Um, <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're working with someone, what is it you're trying to achieve? What is it you're looking for when you decide you want to work with someone and take their portraits? That really depends on the person. Uh, it depends on if they've been photographed a lot. It depends on, what drew me in that particular, how I found them. Um, you know, some models, it's a, it's a look. Some models, it's the fact that they haven't been photographed a certain way yet. And I see that I can kind of fill that artistic void, a, a challenge almost. Some people, it's, uh, for instance, somebody I photographed about two weeks ago was someone I worked with and was just kind of more curious about them in general. And this was a good way of, uh, kind of a, a very easy way of getting to know them better. So sometimes it's about investigation, sometimes it's uh, the thrill of competition, seeing that someone has not, to my mind, been photographed properly yet. Like, oh, they haven't, they haven't really gotten it. You see, you see a bit of a challenge in some of yeah. some of this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially when it, when I started photographing models, the challenge aspect became a lot more prominent. Interesting. Because, you know, uh, I'd see people photographed a lot, and I just I could tell there was something being missed. I could tell that a lot of people were photographing them the same way. I think that's pretty common 
with yeah. models is that most people are looking for the same thing. And I could see that there was another way, maybe a better way that they could be photographed. Yeah. I'm just going to take a personal note for myself. Lou is very <laughs> Lou is very competitive. Never never play poker with him. Right. Um, maybe it's a good time to get some of your images on screen uh, and let the viewers who maybe haven't seen your work get an understanding of this kind of connection that you have. So I'd asked Lou to put together uh, a selection of his work that we're going to talk about on screen, uh, and you can talk about some of the reasons why you decided to one maybe work with that person to why you photographed them the way you did and maybe what story you were you were trying to uh, tell or the emotion or whatever that connection was with that person. So if you want to pull up your screen, uh, I will make sure that that's all working. And of course, while we're doing this, if you have any questions in the audience, just post them in that chat and I'll be sure to uh, get those to Lou either during, if it's appropriate, or at the end, we can do that. So Lou, if you just want to hide our faces on that screen and then go full screen with your selection go. there then yeah there we go it's working right we've got you got you on screen uh unfortunately you now can't see us but uh, we can see that screen so if you want to uh yeah talk through some of this incredible work you have um and it, it's going to be fairly obvious if it's a portrait uh uh uh, uh uh, DSL, DSLR file or a Polaroid, right? Because it, sure. it is yeah. fairly I mean, I'll, notable I'll, on there. You can yeah, point that out. This one is, yeah. is from my Canon 5D uh, for the more technically minded. Uh, I shoot When I shoot digital, I shoot with a Canon 5D Mark II. Uh, I've never felt the need to go beyond that because it never stopped working great for me. <laughs> um, I believe this is a 35 millimeter lens. Uh, this is Stephanie, this shot, we had worked together a few times before. She's a dancer by trade and mm -hmm. I, I never really captured that aspect. Uh, this was the beginning of a longer project. I was doing something simple where I would just have people jump on a trampoline and see what happened. Uh, her being able to move was very different from the other people I photographed much more in the other shots, I focus on their expressions, their faces, but Stephanie's so great at movement that I wanted to back up a bit. Mm -hmm. And then also movement has intrigued me more and more, uh, maybe the past year or two. So I wanted to try to find a way to capture movement in a way that hadn't been captured in, in photos I'd seen uh, in environments I hadn't seen. Right. I mean, you mentioned you mentioned there the trampoline. This was you did a whole a whole project, a whole series, based around this trampoline, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, I think I photographed maybe around twelve people. Uh, and when we when you see a trampoline, like was it like twelve foot square? Was it a little uh, like a, a little disc on the ground? How did uh, you know? How did you? Yeah, it's a it's like one of those exercise trampolines. Right. So okay. I think it's about thirty six inches. Yeah. Um, so fairly so easily, portable. <laughs> yeah, very yeah. portable. Other, I, I, there were bigger ones, but uh, it would have taken a whole yeah. crew. But just so, but just enough to add a dimension to 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 the photography, right? Yeah, and they could actually get a bit of air on them, so <laughs> they it worked it worked well as a trampoline. Uh, yeah, it exactly. was more than just like a little bounce. You could get maybe a good two feet of air on if you wanted to. Most of them were pretty exhausted by the end of the shoot. <laughs> That's a great shot. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let's see how I get out of it. There we go. Um, you know, another one is, oh, this is another one from the trampoline series, my friend yep. Danielle. Um, so this was more what I had envisioned was focusing on the face, keeping it more of a, a close portrait and seeing how I could still evoke movement. And what I found is that most people just became very joyful uh, while they're on the trampoline. But yeah, I guess, I guess it's pretty hard to be miserable on the trampoline <laughs> unless you really hate <laughs> trampoline. But, it is. Yeah. yeah. I figured if they really hated the trampoline, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have done the project. So. Yeah, it was a deal breaker from from day yeah. one. So yeah, when you're jumping yes. up and down on that, it's great. And um, you, 
it's it's interesting because the the closeness of this image it be it's hard to tell you you wouldn't know they were on a trampoline but yeah. it just it, no, as soon as you mention it's on a trampoline it's so obvious like <laughs> the where the you know, the joy's coming from where the movement's coming from uh i just love that aspect of it that you you're so close yet you're using people jumping and stuff it's it's an interesting combination to be that close typically when some you know when i hear someone has used a prop like that or they're they're making you know they've got a wind machine or something it's very rarely are they this close yeah that was something i was trying to keep at the forefront uh, of my thoughts during mm -hmm. the shoots because yeah anybody can shoot anybody can shoot somebody on a trampoline what would what was going to make these shots stand out? And that's what I think generally about portraits and photography really is, you know, if you're not doing something that is different or so idiosyncratically yourself, you know, why are you taking the picture at that particular moment? Other, you know, as, as an art, artistic uh, endeavor, mm -hmm. you know, if you're trying to take photos of your kids or capture a moment, yeah, you don't have to worry about that necessarily. But for, you know, for the art, it's, it's one of the main drivers. It's trying to make it very much my own. And how, um, how do you get that? Is that just uh, like California flair that we've got going on there? With the... <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, yeah. The, that's the uniquely Southern California sun. Yeah. It's, it's a, uh, a proprietary blend of <laughs> sunlight and smog. There you go. Living in Scotland, I don't have many pictures like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, you know, during my trips to England, they they kept saying that I had brought the sun with me, that it would just be there for the length of time I was there, and then it would disappear as soon as I was gone. <laughs> as I was gone. Um, I'll give you one more from that project. Yeah. Um, similar kind of mood. Very and it, yeah, it, it was definitely something I thought about is I didn't want people to automatically know they were on a trampoline. So I didn't want to back up so you could see that they were jumping necessarily. Yeah. I just wanted to kind of intimate that there was movement involved, but it was really about the, the, the expressions for most people, except for someone like Stephanie, whose movement is so great visually. Yeah. I mean, this image, uh, it, if yeah, there's no way I would have known it was a trampoline. She could be, she could be skipping down the road. She could be, right. she could be spinning in in a dress. You know, something like that. But the sense of movement is so obvious. But I think the main thing I see from that project is literally the sense of joy and um, yeah. kind of almost almost childlike joy. You know that kind of. Mm -hmm. Just real, uh, real freedom. I, I love that project that you did. Joy has been something I've been very drawn to for quite a while. Um, tr trying to pull out enough joy in the subject that you feel a sense of joy when you're looking at the image. Mm -hmm. Trying to affect. Yeah, it was it was kind of a larger internal conversation about like how do you affect your audience and what kind mm -hmm. of emotions can you get your audience to feel? And, you know, most of the, most emotions, it doesn't really feel right to make your audience feel, but joy seems like a, like that be a good one. Yeah. Well, boy, now more than ever, should we all yeah. be, should we all be looking at these photographs for, yeah. <laughs> for numerous, numerous reasons? Tell, tell everybody to look at my photographs just to feel better about themselves. Yeah. Maybe, you know, don't you think life would be better rather than having 24 hours of news reels? We just did 24 hours of, like, flicker slideshows of joy. <laughs> Puppies wrestling with each other. Yeah. That would, yeah. Suddenly life would be a lot easier if we stopped listening to the news. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's important to be informed, though. Of course, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, on the topic of joy, you know, this was during a trip to Ohio. Um, I had contacted uh, a few people um, to 
shoot while I was there. And this was like in my hotel room, just playing around with the space. They given me a kind of a business hotel room. There was a, this was part of a really big conference table. There were chairs there was a whole kind of kitchenette. Um, so we were just kind of fooling around with the space. Um, and this was a shoot with Micah here and her daughter who were, who both modeled for friends of mine who live out there. Uh, so really it was just about that particular shoot was about exploring if I could get something different than my friends had gotten with these same subjects. Right. Uh, and this was not some, you know, this particular shot wasn't something I went in thinking about. It was just something that kind of came up during uh, the conversation within the shoot. But it's something that I really, I don't see a lot in photos of her. So I was really satisfied <laughs> with being able to capture this. Great use of, of a model in a different way than, as you say, people have photographed them before, but also great yeah. use of a, an upgraded hotel room. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> excellent use of the <laughs> conference table. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, it's, it's, I'm trying to think, there's, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, Sarizal, she's a model I met years ago, and most of her modeling is either for uh, the company Suicide Girls or other nude modeling. So I've shot several Suicide Girls over the years, and it's always about trying to do something different than what is portrayed in those photos, which, you know, in, in some ways is kind of easy. You just photograph them with their clothes on, but um, I think getting down deeper into what is it they are showing of themselves emotionally in those photos and what is it they're revealing about themselves that you can then try something different with. You know, suicide girls photos are sexualized, are about the physicality and an enticement, um, titillation. Mm -hmm. So working in opposition to a lot of those expressions, emotions, mm -hmm. is kind of what I focus on when I'm shooting women who have shot with that site. Um, right. So Rizzle, there is, um, whoop. Uh, this was Malibu. Uh, and again, a suicide girl is not, you're not going to see a picture, a mood like this mm -hmm. in suicide girls which is not a criticism. They are a very respected site, but uh, was going for something different. Yeah. That last, that last image was, you know, you know, so powerful, um, which is, you know, a uh, very, very different statement, as you see to maybe the images you would, you would typically see uh, in, in other outlets. Um, and yeah, it's, it's incredible, deep, powerful, um, photograph and thank you it's actually rare i see it this large so it's actually <laughs> fairly imposing on me as well yeah it's it's a great image um there's a, couple, a question come in here it may be appropriate oh. to to talk about it just now um a question from brag brag bear let's move that down a little bit uh uh, and they ask, Lou, how do you pick which projects to work on? Um, and I guess especially seeing as you're not, you know, you're not being commissioned, you're not being paid right. to do this. You have the freedom, as you mentioned, to to do what you want. So how how do you pick which projects you want to work on? Uh, a lot of it comes down to boredom. <laughs> you know, if I um, you know, what a, if I just want to shoot anyone if i'm just basically you know a lot of it comes down to what do i want to do today you know i've got if i see i've got some days off coming uh what do i want to do i want to shoot somebody oh but you know i've, I've been shooting the same kind of thing i want to shoot something new what would be interesting to me what would be a good challenge sometimes uh, i'll have some people that i've written down oh i want to 
photograph them in the future and I'll look at the list and think, well, what, what can I, can I do something interesting with them or can I do something new with them? My current list is these are people that I only know a little bit and really just want to know better, want to kind of learn more about them. So this would be a good way to do that. Uh, sometimes you've got creative questions. Looking at other people's photography will often inspire uh, a sense of competition again. Oh, I can, I can do that better. Or experimentation. You'll see somebody do something. Oh, I've, I've always wanted to play around with that idea. So it, it really depends on mood, on what you're interested in, what you're curious about. If you are completely uninspired, looking at other people's photos is a great way to find inspiration to do what they're doing filtered through your own voice uh, sometimes a, a larger project can be if your photography isn't at a point where you have found your own voice that search to discover what your point of view is mm -hmm. uh, that was something i did early on where i had started to isolate the pictures I wanted to take. And so became very focused on taking that same picture every time. I would always take, uh, very similar to this image here, but with a Polaroid, a very close up image, a neutral expression framed very similarly. Let me actually see if I can uh, find one of those in the older photos. So, you know, this is like the classic example of the that early polaroid style i was trying to replicate mm -hmm. at will um very close up a kind of n neutral but not empty not vacant and yeah. so this was a picture especially after i took this which was 2006 i was taking this composition all the time with everyone I shot, um, and I was go, I was, you know, uh, scheduling shoots with friends or friends of friends just so I could work on this kind of composition. Uh, yeah, you see it. Uh, this was a shot from I want to say last year. Oh, looks like I gotta, gotta take care of that. But this is still that same kind of classic frame of. Uh, one of two Hasidic gentlemen I bumped into on the street in Manhattan who wanted uh, to pray with me. And uh, in return for uh, doing some prayer, I, I took their picture. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was the deal. That and they, the had, deal. they had actually, they had never seen a Polaroid camera before. So I got, it was, it was a real <laughs> kick. That's cool. um, but, but you'll see this, the frame is still very yeah. similar to from 10 years. Yeah. 15 years ago. Let's talk about your, your Polaroid work. Um, sure. Because well, it's a very, very banger. different way of working. You know, you're working with, let's say, the 680, mm -hmm. um, which is, uh, I believe, it's just an optical viewfinder, right? You're just looking through. Yeah, I yeah. mean, for a Polaroid, it's, it's fairly rare because it's an SLR. So you're not getting the same kind of parallax you would get mm -hmm. from another Polaroid you've got probably a better lens than you would yeah. get for most Polaroid cameras. So you get a bit more sharpness, you get a better kind of color quality. Um, the sonar autofocus helps a lot, you know, um, and it's a, you know, this is a camera from 1982. Yeah. So, so it's still, it's still, you know, there's, it's still through the lens. There, it's an optical viewfinder. You're not seeing any exposure or you're, you're not, no, you know, no. seeing, seeing what you see. It's a very manual camera in that sense. Yeah. And it's, and, you know, it's, it's back to the old days. It's a single shot process. So yeah. how, um, do you have, do you have a way of working now where are you, are you taking some of these work, this work digitally and, and getting into the mood and the zone, finding the composition and then doing a single Polaroid? There's always a lot of interplay when mm -hmm. I'm shooting. Um, but usually I like to start a shoot off with a Polaroid. Right. So a bit of conversation with my subject. And if I can, if I can nail the Polaroid, the shoot usually goes well a bit. It's, I've always treated it kind of like a magic trick because people don't interact with Polaroids all that often. 
they don't really know what to expect. If I can take that first shot and have it be something solid, then the rest of them, then they've got a bit more confidence that the shoot will go well. Yep. So what I normally do is I'll shoot a Polaroid. It'll be good. And then we'll go into digital uh, and then we'll just bounce a lot back and forth. Digital, right. uh, medium format, Polaroid, as I see the shot. Sometimes I'll see a composition that's so good, it'll work for all of those uh, particular formats. Some shots only work in a Polaroid, some shots only work in a digital, some shots only work in a medium format. I think if I had to break it down, um, I'd probably say that, you know, uh, getting a little farther away when you've got maybe a complicated light lighting situation, that's where I'll go medium format because it mm -hmm. tends to have a really spectacular uh, feel to it. Yeah. You know, I know I'm going to get some flair here with Brenna. I know I'm going to get that. This is just a beautiful kind of glow. Um, when there's a lot of movement, say, you know, so here with Sofula again, I want the digital. I want that fast shutter. I want the ability to take a few shots in a row to try to make sure I capture that. Um, yep. And then when I really, when I really, you know, the, the Polaroid is so much for me about the face. So I really just want to capture the face and maybe a particular lighting situation. So here with like Samantha, like this was, you know, the light as filtered through uh, a fence. Um, and I knew I wanted this kind of composition, but also this light. And I knew the Polaroid would capture that in a way that the other cameras just couldn't or uh you know here with matt you know just i knew th that i'd be able to fill the whole frame with his face and just him having a good time at the end of a barbecue that's exactly what that picture says to me <laughs> just that's after just uh, chilling we had we'd had some ice cream we'd had some barbecue we had some sushi it was a it was a full day it was a, i mean this encapsulated probably a, a 12 hour day of fun. It's that end of day sitting around with good people type photograph. It really just, it, yeah. it says yeah. that just looking at it. You know, it's a, I'm glad you said that because that's exactly the feel <laughs> that that gives. So you're, you're using the, the Polaroid almost uh, as a bit of an icebreaker initially, right? Just getting the people sure. comfortable the in that shoots. zone. Um, yeah, definitely. that's pretty cool. But it's funny how we've become, um, you know, quite polar Polaroids obviously had a kind of renaissance over over the last few years, and and a lot of people shooting Polaroid for fun now. And there's a yeah. lot of great attachment to the tangible, um, final product that you get, and that instant final product that you get with a Polaroid. And yet, years ago, when you know when I started my career, we we were using the Polaroid as the throwaway test before <laughs> yeah. before we we yeah. used the expensive uh, the expensive film. Uh, but I love how it's become uh, such a a valued uh, piece of artwork uh, rather than you know this this kind of throwaway test test print this test proof that we used to use. Um, my daughter has a, a, a an instant camera. Not uh, yeah. by another brand, and um, yeah. it's Fuji. She it's loves okay it. They're, they're a yeah. fine brand. She has she has an Instax, and she loves it, and she cherishes them, and she photographs all her l friends, and she has them hanging in her room, and yeah, it, it's lovely right. to see see that connection. It. Yeah, you definitely get it. I mean, look at the, <laughs> so this. You're telling me this is your hallway, right? Yeah. So I've yeah. got you know the way my apartment's set up is there's kind of a square hallway, so I'm actually. I've got Polaroids on all four walls and the doors. Um, and this is a project I've been doing since 99. Every place I lived would have, you know, some portion of a wall covered in Polaroids. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think the last apartment, the apartment before this one, I really just went kind of crazy with it and covered the entire, it was a studio apartment, so I was able to cover the entire place <laughs> in Polaroids. So that was that was my biggest wall, but I consider this one my finest. Your it's finest. more concentrated. It's almost uh, a few people have walked in and been a little kind of intimidated by it because it's a very kind of intense experience. 
Intense. That's cool. I love it. I love it. It's an expensive, <laughs> it's an expensive way to decorate, but you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's cool. Can we go back to the image uh, that you said you'd shot on medium format? Um, oh, sure. sure. Uh, let's talk about it. So uh, when you say medium format, this is on, on film, yeah? Yeah, so this will yep. be, um, I've got a Mamiya C330 right. that was given to me as a birthday present 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I usually throw, I almost exclusively use Kodak portrait for it. Right. Um, 120, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it's getting harder and harder to get it to find, you know, find it at a reasonable price. Uh, but what about processing? Where do you, how are you getting these processed nowadays? Um, so I've still got a lab, uh, down the street. It's cool. funny, uh, as we're doing this, like I'm looking at all the stuff. I'm like, I can't remember anybody's name. Now that I need to know <laughs> everyone's name. Pressure being live. Yeah. I can't remember the name of my lab, but you're but, still getting, uh, you're still getting it developed. Fantastic. At a, <laughs> still getting it developed at a traditional lab. Um, you know, it's, I, I've done my own developing, but not in color. I can develop black and white, but color is just so hard to. Yeah, no, I, to, to... Uh, I have never, I, I did developing in high school mm -hmm. and found it banal. Uh, I, I oh, did really? not for it at all. So, um, I, I have always taken a suit whenever I, I didn't start with film until, uh, probably, you know, three, four years into doing photography seriously after right. I'd kind of gotten to flick and everything. And I started with medium format. Uh, right. And so there was really, no one was ever suggesting I, I developed my own. Yeah. Um, it's, it's difficult to develop. I, I, I'm old enough to have come uh, from that direction to digital, but again, high school was, was my hook. I, uh, we did for photography or art class, and I'll never forget the f that first time putting a white piece of paper into a, basically a tray of what looked like water and a photograph appearing. And I thought it was anything but banal. I thought it was phenomenal. <laughs> um, watching uh, that picture uh, appear yeah. and then very quickly disappear, probably because you had like over really overexposed good. or something. So um, yeah, I loved I loved uh, I loved the dark room. I actually miss it. Yeah. But. Yeah. I actually, you know, 17 did not, well, no, I think I was like 15, didn't like photography. Yeah. I took the class, no interest in it. It was years before I was able to connect with photography. Uh, it planted is, the seed, it planted the seed there yeah. somewhere. So. Yeah. But this so, is, you know, uh, this is lovely. This, so this is one of my early, uh, early medium format work, but this is, I think, really just, uh, what medium format is all about just the, the, the smooth light, the detail, um, the way it handles color and the, the way it handles the bouquet in the back. Um, this was not by my current lab photo impact there you over go. on Santa Monica, but, uh, but it's, this, you know, this is the kind of quality you get this. As soon as I started using, medium format I fell in love because of shots like this yeah uh, that shell just, depth of field that beautiful fall yeah. off that you get just yeah the focus and I'll shoot falling it away. like 2.8 mm -hmm. pretty much in all these shots uh, all my medium format shots I keep it at 2.8 unless I have to dial it down because of yeah. light um, this was only a few months ago or I, I guess it's almost a year ago <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hey, this is know, still this is, this is still in... March, right? I don't know. Yeah, it's oh, like God. <laughs> uh, I have no this, clue. It's almost October. Can not, you believe that? <laughs> I, this it's almost the end of 2020. Uh, well, thank goodness. May we all make it. <laughs> yeah, can't wait. But, but uh, you know, you can't you can't get this with digital. You can't you, know, you can't even get this with Polaroid. So each camera there there are some things that each camera does better than anything else, and so. I tend to use them as tools in that way. It's like, well, you need a screwdriver for this. You need a hammer for that. Like, oh, this is the shot I need the Mamiya for. Uh, uh, so that's a great sentiment. I love that idea of people recognizing that, you know, there's, there's ultimately, I, I've said it a few times on this show, ultimately they're just boxes with a hole in them, um, letting light in. And you can photograph with, with any of them. But when you're specifically trying to achieve something 
the right tool for the tro the job definitely um, makes makes uh, makes and I think, it easy. You know, I you know on the the website that I am editor in chief of when we do interviews we try to ask everybody at the end uh, which do you prefer the process or the result hmm. and you've always gotten very interesting uh, answers you know I I tend to be more process oriented I like how each camera does something different. I like in, uh, you know, engaging with my mm -hmm. subjects, interacting. The picture is kind of the proof that something happened. But at the same time, you know, you, I do get a real thrill when the result comes out. Absolutely. Good. And when it comes out the way I, I, I had hoped it would. Um, so, you know, like when it comes to like a question of gear, on the one hand, yeah, of course, the gear will not make you a good photographer, but having the right tool to accomplish your, you know, what what you see in your head, that's 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 real. Yeah, yeah, I love the when you get to that point where you can pre-visualize something and then make it happen, enjoy the process, and then ultimately end up with the image that you'd pre-visualized in your head before the. The, the taking off it that's that's a real buzz when when all that yeah. comes together uh, for sure it's, yeah. Yeah. it's uh it's invigorating yeah let's uh let's um look at your kind of portfolio and mass there if you don't mind for for a moment um go back to the the first page you were on or the first group of images um something uh something you and i have spoke about before is i and in fact, you wrote about this for us recently on, on the Flickr blog. I have always admired the diversity that you have within your images. And it's a topic that is uh, very topical, very relevant at the moment, and something I strive to be better at. And I'm very aware of, um, you know, the, the sort of comfort zone, shall we say, that, that I f have fallen into with my work. And I look at my work and I can very, very quickly recognize my own biases by, you know, just how, uh, you know, how undiverse my, my portfolio is. And I said to you that I admired the diversity that you had your work in all its forms, the, you know, the subject matter, the, the, the treatments, the type of camera, the medium, the, the, you know, the models, the people, the cultures that you have. And I was taken aback when you said to me, you weren't happy with the diversity in your portfolio. Sure. Um, you know, especially like this selection is very curated, I think. There's always room for improvement. More men, uh, in, in my own portfolio, that is. Mm -hmm. uh, more people, uh, different shapes, uh, different ages, um, even more diverse backgrounds. You know, diversity is always kind of a tricky word for me. I, I like to use the term representation mm -hmm. uh, as much that I want to represent the people that I see in the world around me. Um, right. Especially in the beginning, when I first started kind of like doing photo shoots and, and hitting up people I didn't know online, it was all women. Mm -hmm. It was all women who were white and lean. You know, it was very narrow. Yeah. And it was a few years before I clued in to the fact that this was because of kind of a, a, a cultural idea of what a photographer should shoot when they're shooting models. What yeah. a model even was, in my head, was very narrow. And so as soon as that clicked for me, I began to try to expand uh, the type of people I shot. But I think that's a journey that has no destination. At, at no point yeah. do I ever think I'm going to be like, well, I'm good. I've gotten everybody now, you know, it's, but that's, you know, that's fun to me is to always try to expand who I'm taking pictures of because expanding who I'm taking pictures of is expanding who I'm interacting with mm -hmm. is becoming more in touch with and in contact with the world around me. 
yeah. uh, which I think is great for photography, but it's also great for us as people, you know, uh, Absolutely. to get, you know, just, just a dash political. I think a lot of the issues that I see with people is that they don't know people who aren't like themselves, who don't mm -hmm. share their background, who don't share their upbringing. They don't know about the challenges that people go through because they've never experienced it themselves right. and they have never met those people. Yeah. Uh, and we're programmed, so that, you know, we're programmed through, certainly our age group, we're programmed through our whole lives to see, you know, portrait photographer is, is this. This is the formula of how yeah. it should look. And, you know, when you're from a part of society that's not represented within that, then yeah it's it's painful and it's dangerous yeah. and i love the i love what you said there about the fact that you you're you can have a diverse portfolio i guess but it's still it's still not representative in totality or and it may never be but diversity is not the end goal and you know representing interacting learning socializing um and you know through all all types mm -hmm. of diversity is, is, is really important. And I, I, I think the goal isn't to have a diverse portfolio. The, the goal is to broaden your horizons and your perspective as much as you can. That is the most enriching thing you can do for yourself. And as photographers, we can use photography to broaden our horizons, to yeah. widen our perspective by engaging with as many different people as possible. So it's healthy for you, and the and the, the photography is the vehicle for you to yeah. get to interact with uh, as diverse and you know different cultures as, as possible. Wide, yeah. yeah. You know, to meet all the people I've met in photography, are people I never would have uh, engaged with. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, you've got Chip here in Ohio. Uh, this is just a surfer friend, Dave. You know, but you know, or uh, Chloe or Hannah, all these people are people that I am able to interact with and I am able to learn from, you know, I grow because I have interacted with these people. Yep. Um, I am living a richer life for having these people in it. It's good. Yeah. I should write that down that's yeah answer. we should we should right. it's okay it's okay i'm recording this we'll, we'll, we can rewind and write that down afterwards um but enriching your life is yeah i mean isn't that isn't that the dream of all artists either to enrich yours or to even better to enrich other people's that yeah you know, i think it's great. not i think unfortunately you know the the goals of art have been narrowed you know, when we talk about photography as a job the goal is to make money and, mm -hmm. and have a good life but what is being ignored is the personal enrichment is the emotional enrichment that you get from art that you can get from interacting with others that you can get from uh, your work interacting with others uh, when it's a job, sometimes when it's your profession, unfortunately, those kind of aspects of it can be pushed aside for your daily concern. Yeah, it can be clouded by by other things, and I, and it, it's lovely. That takes us full circle back to the reason why you, you know you class yourself as a hobbyist. I, I don't, I don't think that's the right term for you. I have to, you know. I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of different terms. I, yeah. I have, uh, there's a photographer I know who I met on Flickr, uh, Ryan Schutte, fantastic work. Um, he and I have argued about that because he considers me to be a professional just due to my passion mm -hmm. for photography and the, the amount sta of the standards and yeah. Um, you know, for me, uh, the professional is someone who does it for a living and by narrowing the definition that way, I can say that that's, I am not a professional because I don't do it for a living. And that's mm -hmm. fine. And I can utilize, you know, hobbyist, uh, amateur, uh, dilettante, you know, <laughs> enthusiast, you know, yeah. uh, all these words, the, the words, the titles aren't as important as how I see it and how I engage with it. And I engage with it on a very 
clear, you know, I, I want to say pure, but at the same time, I don't want it to seem as though professionals aren't pure because that's not true. Some people, many people, it's a pure expression of how they want to engage with the yeah. art. So it's not, I don't think it's about purity as much as just, I've got a very clear idea of how I want to engage with my art. Yeah. It's, um, I, I love the, you know, the world of photography that I live in because there is, there is room within this art form for all of us, whatever our goal may be. It's, it's such a great platform to, to achieve whatever that goal is. And for someone like you that wants to, you know, achieve what you've stated and it not be for, for money, but be for the art form, for the enrichment of yourself, for your soul, for others. Um, it's a great place to be. I love the use of the word amateur. Um, it's a word that um, can be a little bit derogatory sometimes, you know, sure. you're, you're just an amateur, but, you know, amateur comes from uh, the word amour, the love of something. And, mm -hmm. You know, there's no, I think there's no better way to be in life than to be doing something that you love, that you're an amateur at and, uh, and, you know, fulfilling yourself that way and, and not all being about, uh, the paycheck at the end of the day, yeah. but no the disrespect. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There is more to it. I think there, are, it's, it's as much about pushing the idea that there are other ways to engage with art than through capitalism or then through it as something that can get you money. Um, it's just pushing the idea that there's another way Yeah, you know, that can be just as, if not more satisfying. Yeah. I was going to say like the greatest artists in the world never made money from their artwork until they were dead, but that, that, that'd, yeah. be, that'd be horrible to say that. So I'm not going to say that. <laughs> you did not say that. Uh, um, I wanted to touch before we finish on um, a project, another project of yours that I love dearly that kind of surmises this goal that you mentioned about exposing yourself to, um, you know, a, a wider audience, a different circle of, of community that you maybe hadn't uh, been around. And this was this, this kind of road trip you went on. Was it back in 2011? Oh, yeah. 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 Where, um, what was the, the you want, you, you, be, you basically traveled around the U S finding couples to photograph, right? Yeah, that was, um, that was a long time ago now. That <laughs> was uh, a project I did through Kickstarter. Uh, this was back in the day when Kickstarter was a very small organization and the projects on it were very kind of a much smaller scale than you'll see today. My thing was that I wanted to find, uh, couples who had been in long-term relationships and interview them and photograph them. Um, and so what I did was I decided to go across the country, you know, but the, the truth of it is, uh, I had a friend who worked at Kickstarter. Who's like, Oh, you should do a Kickstarter. And it was that opportunity that then had me come up with this idea rather than wanting you know, the idea for the project coming first. Yep. Um, and, yeah, it was, uh, it was amazing. You know, it was a very kind of, it was the longest I'd been out of LA. Um, I'm definitely what we call a townie. You know, I like, <laughs> I like this town. I tend to stay here. So I was gone for a month. Uh, I flew, I took the train, I took a rental car, uh, and I went all the, the, the entire country. I did a, just a huge circuit. Um, and really the photography, did not end up being nearly as satisfying as meeting all these people. Uh, and a lot of people who lived lives that I had never really interacted with because I asked basically the community, the Flickr community mainly and Tumblr community uh, for recommendations of people of couples who lived in different States. So they weren't people I really knew for the most part. Um, so there's a lot of learning about people who, uh, different cultures, different belief systems, and of course, different ways of being in relationships than I'd, uh, experienced before. Sure. It's, it's an incredible project and we're very fortunate to have, uh, 
that work on Flickr, um, yeah. which you know, we're, we're very, very grateful for, and it's, it's very inspiring. Um, if, if you want to find out more about Lou, uh, where would you direct them? Obviously, the Flickr. I'll just would be call a good me. Place. You know, just call <laughs> me whenever you want, and uh, we'll, we'll chat. Uh, other than that, you know, especially nowadays, I'm on Flickr, you know, a lot. Um, I'm trying to get off Instagram as much as possible. <laughs> Um, so Flickr is probably like the, the best place to see my work. Um, I do have a website, uh, leobedlam.com. Um, and if you want to see me talk with other photographers, photographicjournal.com. Yep. Um, we've got a good, like, I want to say like 50 interviews and we do photo essays. We've got about 400 photo essays that people have submitted to us over the years, yeah. over the past eight years. Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful place. There's some incredible uh, stories and and journals of photography on there. So, uh, I have already put all that information in the description of this show. So oh. if you you want to go, you can actually like uh, you can actually just go click on those links here in the description. I was I was wanting Lou to say, "I just Google me," but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, could, you could do that too. Just Google the that. name. Uh, yeah, just come by. Just come by the house. Yeah, just swing by. Let's go surfing. Swing by, yeah, like 7 a.m., Santa Monica, <laughs> Tower 24. We're usually there. Uh, next time I'm in town, we'll, we'll Oh, yeah, I got extra boards for No it. idea when that will be. <laughs> oh, and I definitely don't surf. <laughs> Nobody surfs until they do. That's true. That's true. I'll come take pictures of you surfing. Um, <laughs> Before I say my final thanks, uh, I'm just going to ask the. In fact, you can stop sharing your screen as well, uh, oh, Lou, okay. if you want. Yeah, while I do this, um, yeah, I'm just going to ask the the folk watching if you have enjoyed uh, this conversation, then give it a like here on YouTube. Uh, hit that subscribe button. Hit that little bell notification. As I say, that way you'll be notified of any. Uh, upcoming shows when we release them and yeah it's been such a great uh, a great day uh, chatting with Lou thank you so much Lou I've really really enjoyed this thank you for giving us the time and talking about your work thanks for having me thanks no, for having it, me great. it's been great and uh, yeah look after yourself stay safe and we look forward to I'm seeing best. some more great work next time in town I need a good Polaroid actually that's what I need uh, get on your I, I want to get on your wall I can Probably I'll, I'll talk to somebody. I might know somebody. I can I can probably take care of that for you. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> thank you, Lou. Look after thank yourself you. wherever you are in the world watching this. Stay safe. Be kind. Look after each other, and we'll see you back here for another episode of Smug Mug Live very soon. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye. <laughs>